Alex here with part 37 of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. As with my previous videos, I'd like to take this opportunity to direct my viewers to part zero if you haven't seen it yet. That is the video that contains the detailed disclaimers and the underlying purpose of the series. Two things that I will glaze over are, number one, I'm not in the middle of this right now. My case is completely and totally over. It's closed. This is all behind me. My ex's parental rights have been terminated. Number two, the nutshell version as to the purpose of the series is to give my viewers one big example of my eight-year-long high-conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to end in chronological order. We left off in part 36 with my ex filing an opposition to the motion that I filed, discussed in part 35, trying to have her ordered to uh, turn over the medical and dental insurance cards, details as to the insurance in-network providers, and uh, a request for a no-contact order. In her opposition, she did not oppose the request for the no-contact order, but she did oppose everything else. And I can actually remember my mindset, and I was really upset. The reason why is because it's as if she took our entire past and put together an opposition characterizing me as having done the exact opposite of what I had actually done. While we were together, I went to each and every appointment um, that our son required. And even prior to his birth, I went to each and every single one of her appointments. And it wasn't even as though I was nagged or like she had to pressure me into going and I refused or like reluctantly I decided to go. I was eager to go to each and every single appointment. I didn't miss a single one. Yet, in the opposition, she says the exact opposite that I have been completely uninvolved in his healthcare. And not only that, but that um, my role should just be to only have to take him to the doctor if it's an emergency. So she blatantly states that her role is going to be to make all of the decisions with regards to medical care, health care, and that that's just the way it's always been. And that really got to me. It really got under my skin, uh, my skin. And I've talked about this in a few other situations with regards to some of the other allegations that she raised. And it, there is just something infuriating about having put so much effort into doing the right thing and then having your ex accuse you of the exact opposite. So that really got to me, and it does come out in my op uh, my uh, reply to opposition, um, just how upset I am. There were a few other things that really irritated me that I um, touched on in my reply to opposition, but I'm sure that supporting all of this emotion is the fact that I figured things would be done by now because the case was closed and the judge had ordered that I was to have joint physical and joint legal custody and not only are things not done but it almost as if it's as if what was the point of it all I mean I can remember myself back then thinking why did I go through all of that stress to beat her attorney by myself with no legal training for it to all just not even matter because to me it felt like it was just a label I had legal custody, but what was the point of the label if she wasn't going to abide by it? She was making decisions on her own. She was, um, it was like she was just taking over as judge in a way. She was saying, okay, I'm gonna do everything and you can just have this one little piece of medical care. I'm going to do this, you, it, 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 I talk about this actually in the video, Gray Areas. Definitely, it's a, much watch, a must watch video, but when you're dealing with emotionally immature or a personality disordered ex, a high conflict ex, they take the gray areas and they they lay claim to all of them. Anything that's explicitly stated in the order as yours is yours. If it's explicitly stated as theirs, it's theirs. And if there's any kind of gray area or wiggle room, it's theirs. They, they, they just claim all of it. And you're only allowed to have the teeny tiny piece that's explicitly set aside for you. And... It's honestly to cause conflict. In the past, I thought it was all about control, and to a certain extent it is, because if you don't have any control, you can't cause conflict. You've lost the power to do so. But having the hindsight that I have now, um, the experiences that I have now, looking back, the prime goal was conflict, not control. But seizing control was a way to create the conflict, and having control was a way to um, 
have the opportunity to abuse that control and thus cause more conflict. So I think that uh, when it comes to gray areas, that's the main objective. It's to continue a conflict. And um, if you look at the, you know, the reality of the situation is that if they don't do that, if they actually cooperate, coordinate and communicate with you, um, what's the, you know, the outcome of having done all of those things is the end of the conflict. So I'm going to go ahead at this point and let's get into what I have filed. Here we have my reply to opposition to motion to order my ex um, to reveal medical, dental, personal, health insurance information and for no contact order. Scrolling down, we can see my introductory paragraph and I have finally started to identify myself as appearing in proper person. This is the first time that I've done this and from this point on I'll continue to do that. It's important for you to identify yourself, what you are filing, and who you are represented by. Well, if you're preparing your own document, you're represented by yourself, uh, appearing a proper person. If your attorney is preparing this for you, they will of course identify themselves as having prepared that document for you. I'm going to go ahead now and get started on the reply to factual background. It looks like I'm doing that one thing where I address line by line the factual background that my ex put together. Um, you could do it that way. Honestly, you don't have it. What I'm doing is I'm following that format from that initial petition and answer where the petitioner lists the allegations and the answer, the person who files the answer um, admits or denies them. And you don't have to do that. I've talked about this before. It looks a little bit weird. You can put together your own um, response using your own words. You can summarize the um, factual background, the portions of the factual background in your opponent's opposition that you agree with and the ones that you don't and why. You don't have to follow this line by line approach. And I do eventually figure this out and I, I stop doing this, but it looks like um, I'm admitting to the first paragraph. I'm not going to bother to flip back. If anyone wants to take a look at the uh, previous My Docket series video, you can go ahead and do that. Or you could just download the document yourself from that video by clicking on the link in the description. And then you can look at these side by side if, you, if you'd uh, really like to. But what I'm going to do is just glaze over those and focus on the points of contention, which are the paragraphs that I disagree with. It looks like here my ex characterizes, in paragraph two at least, as having sent an email to me and when I asked for the email she claimed that she sent it in, oh yeah I remember this she loved to do this she would do this all the time I quickly figured out that I needed to make sure that I didn't lose track of this stuff in ordinary relationships if your ex sends you an email or you send your ex an email and that is vital to the child's best interests and they say hey I lost it I deleted it I don't know where it is I can't find it you have really two choices number one you can say no I sent it to you once that's the only time you're gonna get it sent to you or you could think mm, okay that's annoying that they lost it but our son needs this information so I'm gonna go ahead and resend it because if I don't do that it may make me feel good to sort of punish them for having lost something but it's really just going to hurt our son well, she didn't choose that option. She replied um, that she had already sent it to me and she wasn't going to send it again, even though the consequences of not sending me that information was that our son could potentially suffer by not getting the medical care that he needed. We're going to go ahead and take a look at the exhibit. I guess she already posted that exhibit. So here I'm just, again, you can take a look at the document yourself. It was in the previous video and you can look at that exhibit, that specific email. But anyway, what I'm stating here is that None of this would have been necessary. Well, it's not entirely true because I still needed the, the benefits cards and we still needed a response on the no contact order. But arguing over this point specifically is pointless and we didn't need to bring it to the court's attention. She could have just sent it, sent it to me again. This is not something that comes up in the case over and over again. I do believe that this is the one time that it occurred and never again does it occur. But it's um, once some people call making a mountain out of a molehill, it's her opportunity to say, 
that you uh, you lost the email so too bad so sad and it's just that inability for the high conflict ex to connect the child's suffering to their desire to have revenge on you so um, right here I'm saying that since she lost primary physical custody she's responded with complete adverse adversity to cooperation and this is true I talked about this in a few of my previous videos once she lost primary physical custody she had this sort of mindset of I need to get revenge on everyone I need to prove everyone wrong and the way for her to do that is to set up a situation where she can get the evidence that she needs to prove everyone else wrong it's weird because you can't really use evidence after the fact to prove something from that has occurred prior but in her head it does work out that way because if she can somehow show things are happening now she can insinuate that they've been going on even since before I talk about this in um, quite a few videos but one of the best videos I think has to do with um, overcoming lies moving forward it's where I deal with the I think that's the video where I deal with the um, high conflict excess desire to manufacture evidence that doesn't exist um, if it's not that video somebody post it down in the comments below and I'll track it down but I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's the one continuing on here or it may be the video facts versus lies so check that one out as well two videos overcoming lies moving forward and facts versus lies and there, I'm gonna go ahead and recommend one more because I think I touch on it a little bit in the video failure to agree okay so here we continue on and I'm mentioning that she wanted to give our son up for adoption that she admitted she was a bad mom that she attempted suicide all of this stuff that has come from uh, prior to the court's final order and I think that this is um, that she's con she's she's alleging that she can't show that I'm consistently you know there for her son when she herself is the one who actually has those problems I think some people in psychology refer to this as projection uh, I'm gonna go ahead and continue on and here I am again talking about how she won't do anything unless it's explicitly ordered by the court. I talked about this in the video gray areas. But yes, it's if it's not explicitly ordered, she doesn't have to do it. And that's the attitude that she has at this point in time in the proceedings, and it's the attitude that I discuss in that video. Paragraph 3, it looks like I'm disagreeing. Um, yeah, this is where she characterizes me as not having gone to any appointments. So I'm just um, contradicting that or controverting that is actually a better way to characterize it. I'm controverting her allegation and I'm stating that I went to each and every single doctor's appointment of both him and my ex. So I not only did not do the things that she was alleging, I did the exact opposite of what she is alleging. Scrolling down here. It looks like I'm a I don't agree or disagree maybe it's something that I don't have any knowledge of paragraph one of oh the argument okay so we're down into the argument now we're done with the factual background we have here um, she is alleging that she complied with the court's order to provide care and therein lies the problem the court ordered no specifics as to cooperating with me or at the very least showing proof that the child is receiving care and I'm, show, I'm, I'm arguing that she's consistently showing, shown a pattern of behavior where anything that the court doesn't specifically order is to be interpreted at her own discretion. Again, this is something that I have talked about in many of my videos and now my viewers get to see an example of it because we're actually at the point in my, in the My Docket series where it has become abundantly clear this is what she's doing. If I haven't mentioned it many times, you've got to watch gray areas because this is a huge thing when it comes to high conflict exes and how they perceive um, their role with respect to being a good parent. They basically attach it to what the court has directly ordered them to do and not to what a good parent's instincts would be uh, with regards to what's best for their kids. So. It looks like I'm asking to alternate appointments with our son so that we can so that I can communicate with the doctors and have the information needed to verify with the insurance companies or at the very least um, have her ordered to provide proof that the child is receiving care. Scrolling down a little bit more, it, apparently she's bringing up the fact that okay, so I, I guess this is here me controverting her allegation that I've been late to the fact that she's been late as well. And it's, for the most part, at this point, slightly in my favor. 
Um, we've both been laid, I think, an equal number of times. But it's annoying to talk about this because here we are in 2009, and I can tell my viewers that from 2009 to 2016, this isn't a problem. So this is an irritating, again, it's another mountain out of a molehill problem because when this, this keeps coming up and it makes it seem like this is something that's a problem over and over again that just doesn't end. But this was never really a big problem to begin with. And shortly after this confrontation, it's not a problem at all anymore going forward for years and years on end. It just isn't even brought up anymore. So let's move on to the next paragraph. Looks like uh, past hearings, we're talking about um, providing an, an ad. Oh, okay, yeah. So this is the point where she's trying to say that, hey, I changed my mind. From now on, let's just not give anybody anybody's address because I don't want to sound bad by demanding to see his while at the same time refusing to d disclose mine. So the fair thing here is to just keep both of our addresses secret from each other. And I'm really upset here because throughout the proceedings, the initial proceedings, she demanded over and over again to know where I resided. And now that I'm saying, hey, I should know where you reside too, now all of a sudden she's changed her mind. In previous videos, I've talked about using the um, judicial estoppel and also using the estoppel of inconsistent positions on in circumstances like this. Definitely take out my uh, check out my video, a judicial estoppel, learn a little bit more about how that works. But you could use something like that to block your ex from asserting something like this. And I at this time didn't know anything about that estoppel, that particular doctrine. Now here we are 10 years later in 2019 and I do know about it. So that is one of the things that if I had the opportunity, if I had the knowledge back then, that is one of the things that I would have asserted here. Not that it would have mattered because I think the judge's um, solution to this problem was, I suppose, reasonable. I don't think he knew just how bad the situation was going to get. But given the little information that he had, he does fashion a solution that I think is appropriate given his ignorance to the details of the case. And, um, and I, we'll talk about that more actually when his order comes out because his order is going to come out and it's going to give us a really good opportunity to point that out to you. Moving on to... Petitioner has never violated a court order and has no intention to, and it looks like my concerns stem from the possibility of a relapse in my ex's mental condition. It's disappointing that I didn't have those mental health documents at the time, and me not having those mental health documents causes me to continuously speculate throughout the entire case as to what her disorder is. The court absolutely abused its discretion in not ordering those documents turned over to me. By not turning them over to me, I don't know what's going on, so I'm consistently going to think the worst. And I was entitled to those mental health documents, absolutely was entitled to them. And um, if anyone hasn't seen my video, uh, it's a live stream actually with Wendy. I did this live stream last Thursday. It's a command the courtroom live stream. You should definitely watch it because I talk about the use of in-camera um, review by a judge and how um, Wendy mentions it's extraordinarily rare for in-camera review to occur and in her situation she had only ever had to go through that one time when somebody alleged that the documents in question contained state secrets because he was some kind of uh, a military he was involved in the military in some way so in my case I think it's actually it's absolutely absurd that my judge refused to turn over those uh, mental health uh, documents to me and even more so after he determined that the mental health documents had an impact in the case I'm gonna go ahead and scroll down uh, it looks here like we're dealing with the, the, the allegation, these are old allegations that have already been discussed and I'm not going to bring them up in the video because most likely it's going to cause YouTube to yellow flag the video. I'm going to leave them in the documents and if anyone has any questions about to the, uh, if anyone has any questions as to the next portion of this document, you can find the areas where they are discussed in parts 30 of the My Docket series and part eight of the my docket series so take a look at part eight and part 30 and you'll be able to get to the bottom of what she's alleging here and the court has already considered all of these allegations outlandish allegations to be frank the court has considered these allegations and in part 32 having considered all of those allegations still decided to award us joint physical and joint legal custody so i'm not going to rehash these now in this specific video because i don't want the video yellow flagged youtube does that anytime controversial issues are discussed i'm going to just go ahead and move on down and here we have let's see 
it looks like oh this is the attorney fees argument so my ex has argued or requested attorney fees now for the second time if i remember correctly and this time i figured out how to fight back and i discovered that the actual statute that controlled the award of attorney fees is 18.010 subsection 2b not the um the the section that she had cited and i could go a whole lot more into detail here but what i'm going to say is this i have the details and they're in a video titled defend against attorney fees so you can get into those technical uh, details in that video and the other thing that i want to mention is that it's important for you to not get sucked into arguing what your ex's attorney is arguing every single time because sometimes they're leaving important things out and I actually talk about this in the video, how attorneys win. So my ex's attorney is leaving out section 0102B and I am bringing that to the court's attention. I'm basically um, arguing to the court, hey, what she is asserting isn't even on point. 0102B is on point. And you have to not just show all of the things that she's alleging need to be shown, but you have to also show that I have brought an action without reasonable grounds or to harass her. This is a key thing. Definitely take a look at the video, How Attorneys Win, because she tried to do that to me just now, and I was able to sort of outwit her and do the research and find the statute that was necessary to um, basically make it so that the court just could not award attorney fees because she was not alleging that... Um, I was filing something just to harass her or that I had filed something without reasonable grounds. I'm going to scroll on down. And we've got the conclusion here. It looks like an uh, obvious statement here. The issue is not that my ex has failed to comply with the court order. Obviously, I mean, I'm not trying to hold her in contempt of court. That's not my point. That's not what I asked the court to do. So she's trying, that's another thing that some of these attorneys will try to do. They'll try to recharacterize your argument into something else. They'll try to say that you're asking for a certain thing that you've never asked for. And I guess it's it's just one of the ways that they can confuse the judge. So anyway, I'm telling the court, hey, I'm not here to try and have her held in contempt. I'm not trying and here to try and have her ordered to comply with the court order. I'm here to get some relief on some completely different issues that have not been discussed by the court at all. So moving on here. I'm requesting that the court consider the fact that it's been almost a year of court hearings and that my ex hasn't been harmed, threatened, or harassed in any way. The defense that she's in fear for her life is totally contradictory, not only by her actions, but that, but in that she's actually the one that tried to hurt herself. In other words, the only person who's really tried to hurt her is her. That's what I'm trying to point out to the court here. I'm going to scroll down, and we've got the affidavit, standard affidavit, which is in support of the factual allegations asserted in the reply and we've got the affirmation which I have included into the custom document itself which is good list of exhibits here we've got um, six pages this is the police report that I've already gone through um, exhibit one scrolling down okay I've already gone through this document so continuing on the tradition of not going over things over and over again if you would like to review this document you're going to have to track down which video it's in but I'm pretty sure Pretty sure, but not 100% sure, that it is in part three of the My Docket series. If it's not in part three, it's close to that point. So if you'd like to take a look at this, uh, the analysis on this, um, look at part three, maybe it's part four, um, possibly part five, but I'm pretty sure it's part three of the My Docket series. If you'd like to read the document itself, of course, as with my previous videos, you will find it down in the description below, and you can click on the link, download it, and take a look at it. Moving on to the next document here. We have the affidavit of service. Um, I've talked to my viewers before about this. This is something that you can include in the custom, uh, the custom filing itself. Typically, it'll go after the affirmation or after the um, verification slash affidavit. In the in this case, it's a reply. But I have still not figured this out, so I am still filing separate documents every time I serve it. And eventually, I'll figure this out, and you won't see these um, these separate affidavits of service filed after I file a document. But in this case, I have done so, and I am indicating here that I have personally served it on my ex's attorney, which means I went to the law office and physically handed a paper copy to the person behind the counter. Affirmation that I didn't sign. That's odd. Why didn't I sign that? 
And the clerk didn't even catch it. Well, ordinarily, if you forget to sign something like this, the clerk will catch it and they'll reject it. But in this case, it looks like the clerk didn't catch it. Not sure why. Obviously, a mistake on my part. All it does is tell the clerk of the court that I have reviewed the document. It doesn't contain a social security number. So, I mean, I didn't affirm it, but it's just a certificate of service. There's no social security number in there anyway. So, no one was harmed by that. Moving on to request for submission talked about this before I will just give a nutshell description what it does is tell the court that the the briefs that have been filed are ready for the court to review consider and enter an order on this is a signal to the judge that hey we're ready for you to take a look at this now before this is entered the judge isn't going to take a look at anything we're just filing documents we're trying to brief the court there's no point in the court reviewing any of the paperwork this gets filed and a little light bulb goes off at, at the, we'll just say the judge's desk. It's probably in the computer system that they use. And it says, hey, these litigants are letting you know that they have filed documents, that the briefing is completed, and they are now ready for you to render a decision on that, that you know, series of documents that have been filed. We have a video, or I've done a video called Request for Submission, because I need to sort of explain what that is, because a lot of courts, jurisdictions don't even use that in Nevada. Um, not even the whole state uses it here. Only two or three of the jurisdictions in the state use a request for submission. So other jurisdictions, they just on their own figure out when something is ready for review. Uh, you don't have to tell them like you do in Second Judicial District Court and I'm pretty sure the Fourth Judicial District Court. Going into the aftermath, I filed a reply which was free to file. You don't have to attach the motion opposition notice to a reply. And the other two documents that I filed were also free. So I incurred zero dollars in costs. My ex's attorney filed nothing and incurred zero dollars in costs. I didn't have an attorney, so I incurred zero dollars in attorney fees. My ex's attorney would have probably spent a little bit of time to review the reply. Probably not much time. I'm going to say... 20 let's just say 25 minutes because she probably would want to send a copy to my ex and maybe discuss a little bit the details that went into um, my analysis on that reply i wouldn't be surprised if it's less but it could have also been longer so 25 minutes i think is fair the affidavit of service and the request for submission those are two standard documents that they see probably a million times in their lifetime of practicing law and they're very short and I'm going to just give each of those five minutes. So we're looking at a total of 30 minutes for my ex's attorney to review the documents. That is going to come to $125 in attorney fees. If you have any questions as of my previous videos, do not hesitate to post something down in the comments below and I will see you guys next time.